Okay, so we're going to, uh, those of you who, who are in the class, field class, the first part which I'm doing is what we have already done. In a way, it will be preparation for your first test. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and the second half is what we have not done. So what I have distributed is the first half condensed to one third of what I normally have for handout. Okay, so I've cut out a lot of theory and jump right into examples with after explaining where the expressions are coming from. So let's get started basically. Uh, we're going to start from uh, slide number one. Okay. Not yet. All of this. That should be set up. Nope. Oh, almost. Yeah. There it is. Almost. <laughs> this is uh, my favorite topic, so I'll, uh, although I don't think there is a direct use in the FE, but I think it's good to have this in background that you are familiar with the stress strain curve. One more time, I'm sure you all have seen stress strain curve for steel is linear elastic and then plastic and then straight hardening. Right. So you keep that in mind. We are generally <coughs> trying to be in this range where you are just becoming plastic. All right. So this is the idealized version of straight strain curve. In the circle part, you have three points: the proportional limit, the lower yield and uh, higher yield, and your lower yield. Well, Proportional limit, uh, straight hardening is of course at the very top, we like the elastic limit, upper yield, and the lower yield point. The upper yield is because there is a little crooked portion of this that goes up and down, so upper yield and your lower yield. But usually that's neglected when you make a simpler version of this, okay? Uh, the other thing it shows is that your material is very ductile, because you have this much plasticity that flows here and then it takes up stress again, right? As opposed to other materials like concrete and plastics and high strength steel where you have this part missing, our normal steel, mild steel has this. So that helps us in becoming um, a uh, material that gives you plenty of warning before it actually ruptures. Okay. In case of steel, the warning is much smaller. Okay. Uh, what are the common cross sections for steel is most common in structural is wide flange and angles, but here we are list of sections. Anybody not doesn't know wide flange is are the eye shaped girders or beams we see. How many of you have taken any any uh, course that talks about these cross-section of steel. I guess all of you are familiar, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm not going to dwell on this too long, but uh, basically for a wide flange, we have two parallel flanges separated by a web, so make sure we all understand where flange and web is. Flange, <coughs> web, and flange, right? So this is top flange, bottom flange, and web. There are two axes of symmetry. This is the major axis. You can call x, x, sometimes we call z, z, and this is y, y. This is the minor axis, this is the major axis, right? Because of the strength, about the major axis is much higher than the minor axis. So that's why the name minor axis and major axis. Um, the flanges and welds are uniform, as opposed to non-uniform. The other kinds are called S shapes, which are the American standard shapes right there. The flanges are tapered. This is S shape. This is Y flange. So these are used uh, also very commonly, but generally for monorails. The HP shapes are used for files. The specialty about HP shape as opposed to white flange is the thickness of the flange and the web is same. 
M shapes are lighter, thinner waves and flanges for used for structural, not used for structural application. They're used for minor applications, architectural. Uh, channels are C-shaped. Angles are, like the name applies, is L-shaped. The designation for L, anyone can tell me if I write L4 by 4 by 3 eighths would mean what? The 4 is, not the guys in the class, the 4 is this one side, the other 4 is the other side, and the 3 eighths is the thickness, right? So let's make sure we all understand that. Uh, T's are half of white fringes, or M's, or the S shapes. Like you can take half of this, or half of that, or half of HP actually. You can take half of this, and you can create a T. So depending on the parent material used, you could be a WT, ST, MT, or HT, and it's literally cut right in the middle, okay? So that's how you create WT, HT, and T's in general. The other part that we could use for structural steel are plates, pipes, uh, hollow tubes, built-up sections. In case of built-up sections, you can take any of the previous one and add plates or other roll sections on them to make a composite. So why would you make composite? Because the normal roll sections are not enough and you are modifying a frame or a beam or a column or a tension member, not sufficient, but you want to increase the capacity, so you would like to do that, right? Okay, so uh, if you go back to uh, the way we design things, there are three, two actually, the third one is becoming out of fashion, it's called the traditional allowable stress design, which is what is majority of the engineers still use. Then we have allowable strength design, which is right in the middle of these two, but basically these two are similar and this is a totally different approach. But in allowable stress design, we allow the stress not to exceed the yield stress by a certain number, okay? Normally, for example, for threshold stress, we use two-thirds of yield in this method. So we make sure the maximum applied stress is less than this allowable. That's the traditional approach used for many decades now. And ASD, the current ASD, which is called allowable strength design, is not very different from LRFD or load and resistance factor design. In load and resistance factor design, you factor the load and you multiply the nominal capacity, which is called RN, by the factor called resistance factor. And the load factors are the factors that we use to multiply load with, okay? We can go in, like I have done in the class, why we have load factor, why we have resistance factor, because load factors have to do with the uncertainty we have in the magnitude of loads. If the loads are not well defined, then the factors are higher. If the loads are well defined, statistically, have less standard deviation, then your load factor will be small. For example, dead loads have load factor of 1.2 or 1.4, and live loads have a load factor of 1.6. The reason is live loads have a wider standard deviation, then you just plot the distribution curve, okay? Anyway, uh, so load factor, loads are multiplied by load factors, and the nominal capacity is multiplied by resistance factor to get the design capacity. And you always make sure that the factored loads or moments are always less than the uh, nominal value or nominal resistance Rn multiplied by the T. Okay? So that the design value is higher than the applied value. And that's true for all cases. You can apply this way of thinking in case of uh, this thinking right here, in case of tension member, compression members, and bending flexural members. In all cases, the general idea is the same. Okay? The R can become P versus M or F or B, but the idea is still the same. So this is 
very similar to what you must have studied in concrete also. Right? The idea is to the same. Okay, and load combinations are also the same because they come from the same source, which is ASCE 7, right? So whether you're designing steel or concrete, these values or these uh, expressions remain the same. Why am I showing the lower part? Because this is for the ASD, the allowable strength design. The higher, the upper part is for LRFD. In LRFD, the load factors are, you can see generally, more than one. In ASD, the load factors are generally one or less, right? There is no load factor. There is less than one in case of wind and earthquake. The reason being, in case of wind and earthquake, we are looking for loss of life and property. We are not looking for uh, serviceability. In other words, your, your, your structure can have no serviceability left, but you have saved lives and you have saved property. And things are not collapsing on you. In case of other parts, you are actually going to keep the structure from deforming even. It will be serviceable still for the upper, upper part here. For these earthquake and wind cases, if the wind is like a tornado, you want to just save life is all you're trying to do. If the wind get, if the building gets a little crooked, that's okay. So you're, you're multiplying the wind by 0.6 and you're multiplying the earthquake by 0.75, right? So the idea is still the same whether you are concrete or steel. So now we can go to the first part of our discussion in uh, what I call tension number now. If you go to your reference manual or reference book for EPI, the tension part is almost at the end, but I, I, I'm just following the textbook in the class. <coughs> and we're going to start with tension numbers. In all, all cases, whether it's a tension member or compression member or a beam, we always talk about the limit state. What is the limit state that we are trying to prevent from happening, right? So in case of tension members, there are two limit states. One is excessive deformation, and the other one is the fracture. Right? The excessive deformation happens when there is a general yielding of the tension member. In other words, you are stretching it too far beyond the yield stress. Right? And fracture happens when the connection fails. So if you have a tension member, which is being pulled apart, then you could have this could yield or this could fracture. So these are the two mechanisms or two limit states we are considering. And based on that, whichever is weaker of the two, obviously when you drill holes here and here, you're weakening the cross section. Your cross section is lost, right? So you want to know when you pull the tension member apart, whether you're going to fail in this general area by because of excessive yielding, or you're going to fail because the connection is going to break down. Right? So this is called fracture. This is called yielding. So when in the yielding case, you are stretching the member, not literally like a rubber band, but you're kind of pulling it apart, and there is going to be significant lengthening of the member. right? In case of fracture, of course, you're going to break down, and your brace is going to, you're going to have a collapse. right? For that reason, the fee factors are different. The last limit or uh, limit state is called the block shear or fracture through holes. In this case, you could break right there. So in other words, this portion of the member can be pulled away, and this is left with what you attach to, right? So you could have a block shear. These are the three failure mechanisms or, tension or uh, limit states that we are trying to avoid or stay away. We want to analyze these three to see which one rules, right? Whichever is the weakest link is going to tell us what the capacity is for the tensile member, right? Okay, so now we can go to the uh, equations. <coughs> the equation, like I said, RU, remember we talked about RU is less than P times RN. Now, in case of tension member, we write that as PU less than or equal to Pt Tn where Pt is the resistance factor for tension, that's why Pt. And P is because we're talking about axial loads as opposed to tensile load as opposed to compression load or 
flexural load, which will be M. Okay. Case of ASB, which is I don't usually prefer that, but if you're doing ASB, <coughs> then your all your combination loads should be less than the nominal capacity divided by a factor of safety called omega T, which is runs between 1.67 to 2, depending on whether you are dealing with yielding or fracture. The fracture safety factor is 2 because it is catastrophic failure, so you want to stay farther away from it, right? So that's why the values are different. So is Pt is 0.9 for yielding and 0.75 for fracture. Lower for fracture because you want to reduce the nominal value by a bigger amount in case of fracture, all right? So let's look at an example of what can we do if you have a simple bar attached to a gusset plate with four boards. Right, so you have a half inch by five inch plate. Now some of you who have attended the regular class, these are repeats basically, but it's in a nutshell. So it's quicker than what we had a third or fourth pace basically. Uh, we're going, trying to cramp up this uh, 14 lecture into three hours, so just have to, you guys are pretty much done with this, but I, I thought I would go through this for the sake of everyone else, right? So example 3.1, a flat bar half inch by five inch wide, a 36 field, which means, what 36 represents? The yield strength, right? 36 KSI. So A36 field used for tension member connected to a gusset plate using 5 8 inch diameter. So these boards are 5 8 inch diameter. Assume AE equal to AN. What does that mean? There are, there are terms in tension member. One is called AG. This is the gross area. AN equal to net area and AE is effective net area. So the gross area is where you have no holes, net area is where you have holes, and the net effective is further smaller because of inefficiency of the connection. So the largest is AG normally, AN A is smaller than AG, and A is usually same or lower than AN. Uh, you mentioned the 836, the question. Um, is that the only one that the name of it is also the strength? Because like, we have 8572 yeah. and 8992. Yeah, 36 is 992, you, then you go grade 50 and all that. That tells you what the yield is. Okay. Usually you don't have to, in FE at least, they won't mess you up with those designations. They would probably put your yield strength. I don't expect you to know for FE purpose what A36 means, 36 KSI. But they will actually write down the FY equal to 36, I'm sure. Okay. When you do PE, they probably would expect you to know a little more. Okay. Anyway, A36 field and all that. So we want to know what is the design strength using LRFD and ASD. How much, in other words, how much can you safely carry, right, in tension? So, uh, so in this case, like I said, there are three values, AG, AN, and AE, and we are assuming AE equal to AN, or the effective area, effective net area is equal to actual net area. Why is effective less? One more time. It's because of inefficiency of the connection. You lose some more, right? All right, so how do you get AG? AG is simply what you would do in basic mechanics. The area is width times thickness is five times one half is two and a half square inch. And AN is take the AG minus the holes, right? So in this case, you have two sets of holes, right? In any, at any particular cross section, either here or further here, you will have AG minus two holes. So you sub subtract two and a half, you subtract one half by five eighths, and you add one eighth because of the size of hole is being larger than the bolts. The bolts are five eighths. The hole will be three quarters, in other words, right? So that, you do all that, you get one and, a, one and three quarters square inches as your AN, or AE in this case. So your PNs will be two values, FYAG or FUAE, 
all right? So Pn is this, either 90 or 101. The problem is your resistance factor is 0.9 in this case and 0.75 in this case. So this happens to be, even though the basic number, nominal number is higher, the design number is controlled by fraction, okay? So you get the product that simple, really. So you have to consider, like I said, we haven't considered the blocks here yet, right? That's the third limit state. We will come to that in a minute. So in ASD case, you don't factor the load. You just write down the basic load. There is, they are not even asking about what the, uh, whether it is factored or not. But anyway, you, you multiply the yield stress by 0.6 and FU by 0.5. Or in other words, the safety factor is 1.67 or 2. You divide FU by 2 or multiply by 0.5, same thing, right? So you get your ASD. All right, example two, you have a single angle tension member as opposed to a flat box, right? So you have a member like that. Connected to a gusset plate. So the angle is three and a half, three and a half by three eighths. Like that. And you have a gusset plate. And with three seven eighths inch diaboles. So one, two, and three. Right? And these are seven eight inch diaboles. Okay? The angle is three and a half by three and a half by three eighths, right? Okay. So what will be the whole diameter then? One inch, right? One eighth more than the seven eighths. So when you calculate the net area, you will take the gross area minus one whole, right? At any any, any cross-section, you will have one more reduce. You remember, your cross-section is like this, not like that, obviously, right? For the purpose of tension. Okay. So, the service loads are 35 kip, kip di uh, uh, dead and 15 <laughs> live. To investigate this member meets the AISC or not. And the effective area this time is specified as 85% of the net area. The reason being, when you have flat parts, then generally the net area is same as the effective area. When you have other members, then net area is usually not same as effective because only one member, one leg of this angle is connected, right? There are two legs, one coming at you and one we are looking in the, in the plane of the board, right? The member that's not connected makes it more inefficient because you're halfway connected, right? That's why the, the 0.85 AM, okay? So going by the same method except for what we have done before for the 8.5, the gross area is two and a half square inch. How do you get that? It's tabulated, right? You see, it is the area of cross-section of this angle, right? You can approximately do it by three and a half plus three and a half is seven times 0.375. So that's, uh, about two and a half, right, if you multiply. Why is it different? Why is it not exact? Because at the corners, there are some radiuses involved. And at the edges, there are radiuses involved, so it's not exact. Otherwise, if you took a plate, three eight thick, and bend into a L, it will be exact, right? You can just take a plate and fold it. But that's not how you make angles. You roll it, and you, because of stress, stress concentration, you allow more thicknesses at these, right? So anyway, back on this, the gross area is from the tabulation 2.5. The net is the gross minus 3 eighths times 7 eighths plus 1 eighth. Why 3 eighths? That's the thickness of the leg, right? All right. I'm glad some, you know, the people who are in the steel class are more alert and sounds familiar, I guess, right? Anyway, back on uh, this here. So you 3 eighths times 1. Is this. So AE is 0.85 times this, which is 1.8. 
So if you go by the LRFP, then the two conditions we need to consider is FYAG and FUAG. Sorry. Next section should be AE, right? I got that messed up. Okay. Uh, if you can make a note, this should be AE here. <coughs> so 36 times 2.5 and, and 58 times 1.8. So this is bigger of the two. But when you multiply by phi, you can see the other, the bigger one actually is, turns out to be lower because it is multiplying by 0.75 because that is the more, more catastrophic type failure, right? Or the limit scale is more catastrophic. All right, you remember how in concrete design? If you're uh, a reinforced concrete design, you don't want to have too much uh, concrete. You have minimum rebounds, right? Same reason you don't want to have a catastrophic failure. You have some kind of yielding, some kind of warning. So this when you have fracture here through the holes, you don't get much warning because you just pop. Here, because of yielding, because of the stress strain curve having the plastic zone, you will have warning. Something will warn you that things are moving now, right? That's why. So in any case, ASD, you take 0.6 FY and 0.5 FU as your allowable stress, multiplied by the respective area, and you get your result. Okay. So, what did we say? We multiplied the loads by the load factors according to whether it's dead or live, and we found out that the limit for the load combination is 66, and this controls, and since P U is less than P T P N, we are good. In A S D also we are good, right? All right. Further going further, we have two angles in this case in place of one angle. L, L, B, B, I don't think you need to know, but those are long leg back to back. In other words, the five fives will be back to back, not the threes, right? So the short angles will be cut coming out like that, or small. Short of arms will be not back to back. So long leg back to back are connected to the gusset plate using four two by two one half inch diaphragm. This is by way of writing. So you have two by two. You have four holes basically like that. So this is five inches in other words, right? This is five inches. And the other leg is three and <coughs> three. All right. So the other thing they will tell you probably is AEAN. Where do we talk about? AE is 0.75 AN, right? That means <coughs> the net area has to be further reduced by 25% to get your effective net area, right? Okay, that's given so far. In a minute, we'll see how to, how to calculate that also. So you find out that both legs have gross area of 4.82 and net area of 4.82 minus two holes. Because this time, when you fracture this, you will go through two holes, right? So two times 5 sixteenths, which is the thickness of the angle right there, 5 sixteenths. Right? Two times five, which is thickness. Half inch is the diameter of the hole, and one eighth more for the in the hole. Uh, the what? Uh, half is the diameter of the board, and one eighth extra for the the effective size of the hole. The story about one eighth is your standard hole is sixteenth larger, and then you lose another sixteenth for deformation due to punching. So that's, that's where one eighth comes from. So the net area is 3.03, .03. net effective is 3.03. Um, there are two times twice in that. Is that supposed to be multiplied by four? This one? Well, there's one at the beginning as well. No, this one? Cross section. It's for the thickness. First is for the thickness. I might have doubled it. Is it or am I missing two angles? No, two angles. There you go. Two angles. Sorry. Two holes, you don't do two holes, holes two angles. You don't do the gross holes. area is for two angles. This AG okay. is for, if you look in the book, if, if you look in the book, you, you can get both areas or one area. If you're not sure about, then you can always do it by hand approximately, right? Okay. So, you, it's not double dip, I thought I did. But two is for two angles, and this two is for two holes. Right. Okay. 
So that's how you get your net area, and then this is net affected by 75% because we were told 0.75, right? So LRFD, the gross area is FYAG, and effective area, FUAE, and then you multiply by the respective fees, and then you get the design strength, which is lower of the two is 131. So that's your strength. Now in an ASD, you, uh, you do it by allowable stress, right? And keep in mind, I don't think this will be an exercise where you have to do both of these, but if you do in the exam, in FE, then you need to keep in mind that usually the ratio should be around one and a half times between LRFD and ASD. What it means is if the load factor, uh, the load factors are on an average 1.5, then they both will give you about the same results. Okay, this is where we come to the U part, where why we, the difference between the net area, where you take out the two holes, versus the effective net area, the 0.75 or 0.85 or 1.0 that we have used between AN and AE is explained by U generally. That's the main reason. You, this is the reason you have inefficiency in the connection. So U represents the inefficiency part of the connection. If it is one, which is the case where a flat bar is connected or welded with bolts, or, then U is equal to one because there is no inefficiency. Or if you have an angle or a wide range where all elements are connected. In case of angle, you have to connect this one as well as this one. Then your U equal to one. Otherwise, it's usually less than one, right? Because it takes a while to transfer the load from this leg to both legs. You're losing something, right? Just keep that in mind. All right, so efficiency depends on one minus X bar divided by L. That's the simple answer. So what is X bar and what is L and why are they there in the numerator and denominator? That's what we need to look at. So what is X bar? X bar for case of angle, which is what you will normally deal with in FE, is the distance from centroid to the face. So this is your X bar. And what is L? L is the length of the connection. This is L. So now you can see why we have X bar in numerator and why we have L in the denominator. Because the longer the length, the bigger the U, right? Because the denominator goes up, the total thing goes higher, right? One minus smaller. When X bar is large, that means you are further away if the hole is here somewhere, or in the centroid, sorry, is here, and you're connecting here. This is your connecting point, basically. Your gusset is here, and you're putting your bolts through here, right? So you're that far away, you know, this is the distance between your actual connection and the centroid of the force. Because that's where your centroid of the angle is, right? Force will be going through the centroid, and your connection is that far away. So the farther you are from the connection, the more inefficient you are, right? So keep that in mind. That's the reason for X bar is in the numerator. Farther you are, bigger the X bar, less the U, more inefficient you are. Right, so the smaller you have, more you have to reduce the area by, right? So there you go. In case of plates, because they are connected, plate is the only <coughs> member that is two-dimensional, right? Not three-dimensional. So you have U equal to generally one. Except when we have welded connections with no transverse weld. So if you have a flat bar like that, I can write up to this, right? Okay. So I can go. This is your gusset plate. And if you're welding only these two lines, then depending on the length of the connection, your U could be one or less. Where L is equal to the length of your weld. This is L. So in other words, if you can weld for a while, if you are sacrificing more length in connection, then you could be made equal to one, okay? In other words, you, are, you don't have the other weld. This weld is not there. If you have all three sides, 
then it's going to be one anyway, right? Or if you have two sides long enough, and what is long enough? Two times the width. It depends on the width, which is this right here. Right? You can see now why width is in picture because you're pulling at the center of the plate, and if this is a wide plate, then you are having distribution problem with stress. More stress in the middle, less here, you're losing efficiency, right? That's why they force you to have this equal to 2W for the length. Then you can have W equal to 1, all right? Okay, now let's look at an example to calculate the shear lag factor. Determine the effective net area for tension number L66 by half with 5H dabbled, two rows of three connected to a gusset plate. So you have two rows of three. One, two, and three. And the angle size is L six by six by half. Remember these spacings are usually three inches between the angle, that's the most common distance between the holes for all connections, right? So if you think about two rows of boards, you can't have a four inch angle because then this will be three and you're left with very little material. So you got to be at least a five inch angle or a six inch angle to have two rows of holes. Right, so we are six so we can have two rows of holes. So the AN, which is the net area, is the gross area, which is 5.77, which is 12 times half is 6, so it's less than 6. Are you make, is that making sense? If you open up the 6 by 6, you are 12, right? 12 multiplied by half is 6. So if it is not making sense to you, you stop. This should be close to 6, right? So it's about that, minus half, which is the thickness, times 5 eighths, which is the diameter of hole, plus 1 eighth due to hole, times two holes, because there are two holes at any section you can take. So that's your net area, 5.02. And now we are after the U factor. Only one element, if both elements are connected, then U equal to one anyway, since we are connected with one, which is normally the case. Then from part one of ASC, X bar is 1.67. That's the distance of the centroid right there. So that centroid is 1.67. And I, 2 by 3, the length, 2 by 3 is, like I said, 3 inch distance between the holes is typical. That will be given to you. You don't have to remember this. <coughs> three inch. They will give you that number. So typical doesn't mean it is always true. This could be four or two and a half. Okay. Can be less than two and a half for for this, I don't think. Two and two two and two thirds times five eight could be two. But anyway, three is the most common, and they will give you that. You don't have to worry about. So anyway, uh, the length of the connection is six inches. So X bar by length is six, is 0.722. So the effective area is 0.72 times the net, which is 3.62. There is a shorter way of doing this, but since in FE they don't give you that reference, so you just have to remember, this is part of the class we talked about. You guys remember this? There is a shortcut. If you don't want to go through this mess of calculating U, X bar, and all that, then if you have three bolts in the direction of loading, you can use U equal to 0.6. That's one of the rule or empirical rule, okay? So, but you don't have to remember this part. So, 0.722, right? So now you know, up to this point, how to calculate. And uh, I'm going slower than what you want. Determine the effect. The, uh, now you have done what you've done. You have found the shear leg factor also. Now you can calculate the effective net area also. You know gross area, effective net area. And you know what to do with them. You multiply them by yield stress or ultimate stress. And multiply by the fee. You get your design tensile strength. So, if you have words on three sides of the same angle, then what happens? The U becomes uh, 
different because your length is, what's the length? Three sides, we don't give you the length, it's in the book somewhere probably. 5.5 is the length. Okay. This must be in the example. This is 5.5. Where this word is. The length of the word is 5.5. From here to here. With words on three sides at the gusset plate. So AN, which is net area, is AG because there are no holes, right? In this case, because you're welding, you will not drill no holes, right? So that will be your AG equal to AN, right? Since only one leg is connected, so U is less than one. So what is it? One minus X bar divided by L. And X bar is still the same, like we had 1.67 here, no difference. The L is different because L before was only three inches, right? Or two times three, now it's five and a half. So it's different. So it turns out to be 0.696, and the net area is 4.02, which is much higher than what we had here, 3.62, because we don't have any holes. Even though the U is smaller, right? The length is smaller. All right. Wait. Um, if you do one minus 1.67, won't that be a negative number? This one, this one. Divide that. No, actually, this should be a bracket around this to the power absolute value. Yeah. No, no. You put a parenthesis before 1.67 and one after oh, 1.5. Okay. See, you don't you don't subtract 1.67.1 from one because you're subtracting this whole quantity. Right? What's the order of operations? Am I following that? Yeah. No, I don't need the parenthesis. <laughs> no mind. Okay, you're good. All right, staggered fasteners. Now, the only other variation is sometimes, because of lack of space, you could have holes like this. You can, you can stagger them, right? So this, this is called stagger. This is called gauge. This is called S for stagger. Okay? So when you have staggered hole, you use a smaller diameter, B minus S squared over 4G, 4G, where G is the gauge and S is the stagger. So where is the gauge and where is the stagger? Let's see, I, I wrote down too many things here. So this is the gauge, which is perpendicular to the direction of force, and the stagger is the, in the direction of force, so this is S. S and S. Am I doing it wrong? I'm not sure. Usually, is one, 
2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 18 inches, right? So that's the total length of your connection is 18 inches. Okay, so that's the stagger. If it did have stagger, they would be lined up. This would be right here, right? So that's zero stagger. This is stagger of three. So the, uh, the, the only difference is the equation is same, except your effective diameter is the diameter minus something. The reason for that is your, your crack possibly can go through here. And this staggered angle is, is not quite used throughout the diameter. You're using only a portion of this. So you are a smaller diameter effective, right? If you look closely here, the crack that is going to break this up is going to take a direction like this. So you're, you're breaking up a smaller part than half, right? So you're, you're reducing the effective diameter. And that's the reason we are doing D minus this number. The bigger the stagger, the uh, smaller the diameter. Make sense? OK. So how do we do this? Along the line A, B, C, D, E, let's do this. A, B, C, D, E, OK. So A is here, B is here, C is here and D is here, and E is here. Because that's the first line of breakage. You could actually have a line like that. <coughs> you can break You can break here, or you can break like that, right? So we are going to consider which one is the weaker of the two, and that will decide whether it's going to be one or the other, right? So along A, B, D, E, A, B, D, E, if you go straight down in other words, then Straight down, net width of failure is 16, which is 10, 3 plus 3 is 16. Minus 2 times 1 plus 1, 8. 1 is supposedly the diameter of the, uh, I didn't write it down, D equal to 1 right there. Okay. Is that the diameter of the hole, or that's the diameter of the board? Bolt diameter one inch. Okay. So bolt diameter plus one inch is the whole effective bolt diameter, right? Times two because we pass through only two. So the effective area is thirteen point seven five. Along A B C D E, where we are going zigzag, A B C D E. How many holes are? If you start, you have to follow the arrow. Now be real careful how you do it. You're coming down like this, coming down like this, and like that, right? So this is the first stagger. This is the second stagger, right? This one is not because you're coming straight, right? The one that is a crooked line is the stagger. So you have two holes right there in this line. So you do D prime is D <coughs> minus stagger square divided by 4 and g is 5. So it is becoming less than what we had before. It's only 0.675 as opposed to 1.125, right? And the net width is 16 times one hole full and two holes staggered, right? So the net is 13.53, which is smaller of the two, okay? This is the worst it gets, basically. You got this one, then you are pretty much done with tension numbers. Pretty close to block shear. This, this is the other part of the so, so. so, in case of block shear, we have a block of material failing in tension and shear in this case. So you have, like I was describing before, if you have an angle like this with holes like that, and a gusset plate like that, then you could leave a crack like so. That means this part here can leave without breaking through like that 
right? So you can split like that too. So that's black block shear. So in this case, we are going to consider shear failure on this and tensile failure on this one, right? So if you combine these two, then the equation becomes basically this. The equation is 0.6 FU A and B, B for shear, and UBS FU A and T, T for tension. So the A and T will be this area right here, A and T, and this right area is A net B for shear, right? So this from here to here, right? So let's see how we calculate in the example. And the UBS is a number one when tension stress is uniform, which is generally applicable for angles and gusset plates and most core plates. <coughs> so in case UBS is sometimes not one, but generally it is one. So UBS is one, and that has to be less than 0.6 FY, a GV, G means the gross, and UBS, FU, A, and T. So FU, A, and T, UBS is common to both, right? All we are doing is comparing this F U A G V A N B sorry and F Y A G V whichever is more critical right if this comes out to be lower then we will take left if this is lower then we will take the right okay so 0.6 U is the shear rupture stress that's why you got 0.6 U A N B is the net area along the shear surface like I indicated here. And A and T is the net area along the tension space right there. A G V is the gross area along the shear surface. So A G V means you're <coughs> including the holes. That means you don't lose the area because of holes. That will be a gross area, right? And U B S is one. So let's see how we can apply this. Compute the blocks here for a tension number of figure 323. We have an angle with three holes, just by the head drawn, I guess. Three inch apart. So you have three, three. And the last part is probably one and a half. Yeah. This is one and a half. And then uh, the vertically, we have two and L three and a half. So this is, did I get that right? L three and a half. And Fy equal to 36, Fu is 58. So you just have to plug those numbers. You just have to watch out how you get net area versus gross area. That's the only trick you have here. So the gross area is 3 8 times 7.5, which is combination of 3 plus 3 plus 1 and a half. And the net area in shear is the gross area in shear, which is AGV minus two and a half holes. Now that's where I wanted to tell you, you need to be watchful. It's two full holes. This is a D, this is a D, and this is only half D, right? That's why two and a half D, okay? So two and a half D times the thickness, which is the thickness of the angle, right? So that's how much area you are losing out of the gross to get your net, 1.875. The A and T, which is the net area in tension, is A, G, T minus only half hole because your cracking passes through half, so this is your D over 2. So you only consider this height, which is, what is it, 1 and a half inch, and reduced by the half the diameter of the hole, right? Which is, in our case, the diameter of the hole effectively is 7 8 plus 1 8, which is 1 inch. So that's, that's why there is 1 inch here. That's why we net case 1 and a half times 3 8 minus half of 1 times 3 8. Half, in this case, the half is the thickness, 1 inch is the effective diameter of the hole, right? Which is 7 8 plus 1 8. So that's the area. And UBS is 1, so you calculate the left side of the equation we saw. This one, which is 0.6 FU NB plus UBS this, so it is that, or this is the number, 
which should be whichever is the lower of the two, left or right. And it turns out the right is 82. So you have to consider the right as the It could be left or right, whichever comes lower, right? All right, design of tension member. I'm not sure this will be an FE or not. I'm not really sure, but maybe they do. <coughs> because they have given you plenty of information on the section properties. So they could ask you, I would think. I don't see any handles here. That's the only thing. They might give you a flat bar. The angles are not here. They might have to give you in the question itself what the area is. But I don't see that here. So anyway, uh, design of tension member. In the case of the design of tension member, as opposed to what we have done so far, is they give you the size and you analyze whether it is adequate or not, right? Now you're going to pick the size, whether there's a flat bar or an angle. You will tell what size angle to use, for example. So in this case, uh, you have to go through some tables. That's why I'm not so sure we should be doing this. So let's take a break. Let me think about this. Tension member with legs of 5 foot 9 is to raise B equal to 18 kips and leg lie of 52 kips. Select a bar member with F5, 36 and 7 and 10 reports. U equal to 1.0. Okay, so since we don't have the sketch made here, there is no sketch member of that. Okay. So how do we go about doing this? You have to obviously calculate the factor load. We ignore 1.4D by inspection because you can see the line is much bigger, so no need to worry about this combination. Usually this combination is the one that controls anyway. So you go by that and you get your factor load of 104.8 kips. Then the required area and effective area, required effective area, required gross area, gross area is 3.23 inch square and 2.41 square inches. So you try something, basically, it's a trial and error in this case, right? So you try one inch thickness. So the required width is based on this 3.323 gross, the required width is 3.23. So you try three and a half, the next round number, uh, next half. <coughs> three and a half by one inch bar. And the key is that you cannot say, okay, since I have got the gross area, I will get the net area. You're not sure. So what you're doing is you're checking for the net area, which is 3.5 times 1 times 1, which is 2.5, which is more than 2.41. Right? So that's all we are doing in this case. And L over R ratio is, needs to be more less than 300. So L is uh, 69. 5 foot 9 is 69 inches. And R is the <coughs> of inertia, which is 1 over 12 BD cubed divided by the area, which is 3 and a half. Everyone with me on that? R value? So L over R is 239, right? So that's good. There is no hard and fast rule for this 300 business, but the recommended value is 300, so make sure it's not too slender or too much flopping around, right? That uh, in the ASB, you don't multiply by load factors, and you get a uh, total load of 70 kips. And gross area required is the load divided by the allowable stress, which is 60% of Fy, or net area divided by half Fu. And you get required net area is 2.41, and required gross area is 3.24, which is coincidentally not that far different from LRFD. And so you try the same bar, three and a half by one, and it seems to be working. And it's all in your, there's nothing complicated here, really, except for making sure L over R ratio. That's why they have given you the length of the member five to nine inches. Otherwise, it doesn't come in picture at all, right? Okay. Uh, I think we are not going to go through, like I said, about the angles and other parts. We, we jump into the, because people will be running out of time, we may be pushing 10 o'clock if we didn't go any faster than this. So in compression members, the key is that compression members are light tension members, except they're not, because there are two complications. One is they don't want to be too slender, or they will buckle 
on you, right? And then the other complication is there is a uh, uh, yielding, general yielding of the member if they are too short. So you have to decide whether the, the member is going to buckle or not buckle. If it is going to buckle, then the Euler's equation will help you decide what is the critical stress on load. If it is not going to buckle, then you have to come up with something else which AIS tells you what to do. How much compression can you allow if it is a short column of loops, right? In other words, buckle. Okay. So uh, normally there is always some crookedness or the load could be eccentric or the, me the member could be subjected to lateral load. But right now we are just looking at compression members we are ignoring any moment or any significant moment. So that sometimes happens. Usually not. Usually you have some moment. But in order to reach uh, members that have compression and flexure both, we have to go to compression members first. Then we can do an interaction equation. You have done concrete design, right? You have interaction equation for columns, right? Similar approach. Okay. All right. So as the cross section, as the cross section increase, uh, for a given cross section, as the load increases, the the length, the, uh, the length decreases for which it will become unstable or it will buckle. Right. And this equation, which is a couple of hundred years old, still works pi squared EI over L squared. In other words, if you have the critical load where the column is going to buckle is a function of this constant times the elastic modulus, which is material property, the I, which is section property, and the length of the member. The longer the length, smaller the force, bigger the I, a bigger the elastic modulus, bigger the load, right? So if it is concrete, then E will be smaller. If it is steel, E will be larger. And according to the load, the load will be larger. So the key is to spread the area away. Rather than having a solid rod, you will rather have a pipe so that your I is larger, okay? So with that, let's see if we can do a simple calculation. See if a W12 by 50 column with length of 20 feet, both end pin is subjected to load 145 kips. See if it, if it is going to be stable or not using the equation we just saw, which is like that, right? So if you use that equation for 12, column W12 by 50, let me see if your book or the reference book has a 12 by 50. Here. Yes. It does, good. So if this is like your AISC book, and it gives you the properties of area, depth, moment of inertia, radius of gyration, and all that, right? Now keep in mind when you write radius of gyration, which is not yet, you haven't converted it to you, but moment of inertia in this case, you will use the which axis? Y axis, weak axis, or strong axis? Not the class, other people from outside the class. There are two moment of inertia, right? Because we are looking at a W12 by 50, right? So if you have W12 by 50, you have a Y axis and you have an X axis. So you have a IX and IY. So when you're writing the equation pi squared EI L squared, then what is I? This or this? IY, because that's what will be the minimum, right? That will give you a lower value. So you want to use the lower value because it will buckle about the, it will buckle left or right, not up or down, in other words, if you apply the load, right? Okay, so with that, you're going to write down uh, R equal to RY from the table, by the way, so you change the equation already. You, you can write the equation we had before in terms of various of gyration like this. Pi squared E A or L over R squared, right? So pi squared uh, E is 29,000 for steel, and A is 14.6 is from this table, right? The second or third column, second column, 12 by. Let's make sure 12 by 50. 14.6, right? So that's 14.6 is the area, and L is given as. L right there, 20 times 12 is your length, and 1.96 is also given by this here. Everyone 
make sure you're not fumbling in the test. So the R is given as Rx and Ry. So you're going to use Ry because Rx is larger of the two, right? You want smaller of the two, right? That's the axis of one that will tell you which way it's going to buckle. So 1.92 is the Ry. So anyway, you calculate all that and you find out the load required to buckle is 278 and apply load is 145. So it has not buckled and the factor of safety against buckling is 1.92. Excellent really. So now as you ex reduce the height of this column from 20 feet to 2 feet, what happens? If you try to apply this same equation, by square d over r square, you'll see the value you get for P critical is 27,000 kips, which is way over, you can imagine, right? It will yield way before that. So this doesn't work. So instead of that, AISC gives you another equation, and that's what that is. So if your column, the nominal compressive strength is F critical AG, if K over R ratio is less than this, then F critical is that. If K over R is greater than this number, then F critical is Fe times 0.877. Where Fe is the same old Euler's equation, pi squared E over K over R ratio. Now K has been inserted here because K tells you the effective length of the column, depending on the air conditions. No different than concrete, right? Same thing. If considering the air conditions, so K comes into picture. All right, now what, what are we doing here? <coughs> if K over R ratio is less than this number, which is constant for a given material, right? E is material property, F Y is material property, then it's a given number, then you will behave this way, which is inelastic behavior. It won't buckle, it will just keep on going. It will start yielding. Or it will buckle inelastically. In other words, if you buckle with this kind of short length, it will buckle permanently because it is in inelastic behavior. Your stress levels are very high, beyond yield point, right? So you you do this number. And if it behaves with K over R ratio bigger than this critical number, that means your column is a certain length or taller, then it's going to behave, so it will behave like Euler's. In other words, it will be elastic buckling. In other words, you put the load, it will buckle, you remove the load, and go back to the shape, right? So that's the difference between these two equations. So that's why you need to know which one are you going to apply depending on the length and the radius of gyration, right? Is it making sense? Okay. So let's try this on this 14 by 74 column with Fy equal to 50 KSI. The length is 20 feet. And K in the end, that means your K value equal to 1, which is what we have used. So your K L over R ratio, remember this is what you get on the denominator, right? K L over R ratio. So you calculate K L over R ratio. It turns out to be 96.77. It's less than 200. That's the other limit you got. According to AISC, you should keep your K L over R ratio below 200, if possible. Not necessary, but that's suggested value. So you check that against that. Then you find out based on this other thing I told you, it's like 4.7 over EOFY square root. You find out what that is for in our case, right there, is a number like that, 113.4. In fact, you can remember this number, you'll be good for the most part. You know why? Because E is given and FY is also generally given, unless it is an angle, right? So normally columns are white flanges. So 113.4 is a magical number, above which you will buckle elastically, below which you will be buckled inelastically. Right? So you want to remember this number, 113.4. For 36 KSI, it will be a different number. Would it be higher or lower? Higher. Higher, because 36 is in denominator, right? So you can also calculate that number beforehand. If you remember, you'll be good for you, right? Your uh, reference book gives you another way of doing it. You go back to this book here. Then it has on page columns, page 150, lower right. It has KLRS ratio equal to 802.1 divided by Fy, square root of Fy. The reason is, the Fy could change depending on 36 or 50, right? So 
you can remember either way is fine. It is given to you. So anyway, once you find out this, then you compare your actual KLR ratio 96.77 is actually lower than this critical number. So you will have what I call inelastic buckling. In other words, if this column buckles, it won't bounce back. It will remain deformed if you remove the load, right? So you're going to have inelastic buckling. So if you use for that, you're going to use this equation, this crooked equation, right? You have to find out this power and all that good stuff. So let's see what how we do this. So in order to find that, you have to find out Fe. So that Fe is 30.56 because that's the Euler's stress at which a, buck, a column is going to buckle elastically. And then you find the ratio of Fy or Fe, which is 50 divided by 30.56, and you take that is the power of 0.658 times 50, you get 45.2 KSI. In other words, it's going to buckle inelastically at that stress, 25.2. Okay? And you multiply by the area of cross-section AG, which is 21.8, multiplied by the resistance factor of 0.9, you get the design strength of 494 KS. So you found the, this is the design compressive strength of their column. Okay? It's not that complicated, is it? it does, it's, it's not much more than this, really. And ASD, uh, you take the FA, which is 0.6 F critical, which is, you already calculated that your F critical. 60% of that, <coughs> and multiply by the same gross area, 3.9. Keep in mind, this is not the only way it will fail. Sometimes there could be Torsional buckling also, but not, not for the right <coughs> hand section, that's for plates. Okay. Now let's see how how do we take care of the local instability that we see. Your book does, or your reference book does talk about local instability. So we need to consider that also. Okay. So before a column a column can buckle elastically or inelastically. Now this sounds familiar to you guys because I was talking about this only two weeks ago, right? The column can buckle elastically or inelastically, but independent of that, you can buckle locally, either the flange or the web, right? You can have a web crippling or a flange crippling. Something will go wrong, like you'll take a very thin material and make a wide flange, and you start loading it, then it, before it, the whole cross-section buckles, you will have a localized problem somewhere. So we want to find out whether that premature localized buckling will happen or not. And then see which one controls of the two, global versus local, right? That's what we will do, okay. And because I talked about thinness, what do you mean by thinness? Compared to the width, how thin it is. The wider it is, the more thick it needs to be in order to not have local problem. So for example, if you're designing a tall plate girder, like if you go to AK Steel, I still remember there's a nine foot tall girder about the height, height of the ceiling. That's how tall the, the plate girder is on which the crane rolls, right, rolls. Now in that case, because the plate is from here to here, it has to be a certain thickness like one or one and a half inch or it will have local problem, right? So you have to look at the H over TW, or height of the web divided by the thickness of the web. So you have to consider the height, thickness, or in case of flange, the width to thickness, right? So you're going to look at that. The unstiffened elements are the flanges, and the stiffened elements are the webs. Why do we call them stiffened and unstiffened? Because the free end of the flanges, these two, or those two, are free to move. This case, in case of web, the both ends are stiffened with the flanges. So they are not free, as free to move, right? They're restrained by the other elements. So they are called, the webs are called stiffened, the, the flanges are called unstiffened. So the, the uh, limiting values are different. That's why the, the limiting values called lambda r's are higher for stiffened members and lower for unstiffened members. In other words, these are more prone to localized buckling, the flanges, as compared to the web for the same thickness. Guess what? If you look at the rolled sections, 
the webs are thinner than the flanges. And the reason is these things are stiffened better. So the local problem will not happen in the web, even though they are thinner than those. If you look at any cross section, right? Unless you go to H section where these two are same. The other sections, these are thinner, those are thicker, right? All right, so limiting values. Let's look at the limiting values. For example, lambda r for h over tw, which is the height of the web times the divided by thickness of web, has a limiting value of one and a half times the square root of e over fy for webs of i shaped section versus lambda r d over tw. Oh, for WTs, never mind. So you take the same section and you remove this from here, and you look at the WT, then the web of this, this part right here, because now it's not stiffened anymore, right? This other part is gone. So this is as bad as this one. Then the value for that one is 0.75, one half of this basically. Okay? So this will be more prone to buckle than what it used to be. Okay? In terms of H over TW or D over TW, right? Okay, so let's look at uh, an example. A compression memory is subjected to dead load of 165 and live load of 535. The memory is 26 foot long and a pin at each end. Using A992 steel, select a W414 shape. Wow, we are already selecting. Let's see what happens. So PU, which is factor load, is 1,054 kips. This needs to be less than or equal to PCPN from the column load tables. So now, let's see if, if you have that in this book, right? We have done this with AISC book. So let's see if you have that. I honestly haven't checked that. Uh, I hope this is clear. Uh, you're looking for a W14 column, right? OK. So you're looking for the column table. I hope there's a column table. There. Last one. Available strength in actual compression. The last table right here. Okay. This one looks like that. Right? So you go down here. Effective length and W14 by, we don't know what. Uh, and our what, what is our effective length? 26 foot long and pinned at each end. What does pinned at each end mean? The k value equal to 1. Just by counting, what is this? Right? k is 1. Right? Okay. So the kl is 26 feet. So you go on this right here and go to 26, which is down here. And you're looking for a factor load of 1060. So 26, 1060. I don't see. You're out of luck here. So suppose that example doesn't apply. Um, anybody has manual? No? Anyway. The, the corresponding table in the manual, the procedure is same in other words, right? I may have to cut down the load to 300 or something to get it, right section. But in other words, they won't give you this big. So you go back to the corresponding table here in columns. You go back to this right here. <laughs> and the corresponding table is, you don't have that, so just trust me. Or it's all here anyway. So corresponding table, I don't think I need to show you. Uh, move right till you get this 14 by 132 pound, that's why you don't have your <coughs> table. So in other words, suppose you had only 200 kips here, then you can look at this table and you're looking for 200 kips in 14 and 26 foot length, then you go down from left to right till you hit just over 200, which is 250, 14 by 61 will do it, right? So the procedure is still the same, and I don't want to confuse you with this manual I appreciate. This may not help because nobody has it. All right, so it's, it's really not that much more complicated than this. We had a couple of uh, wrinkles in this that we will see. Select the lightest W shape uh, for this, and I hope 275 might work in our case. So for example, they may ask you to select the lightest W, not W14, but any W, right? And your load factor load is 
275 pips, and KL is 24. So now what we will do, we'll go to the same table here, and you look for, in each case, you can start with 14, go to 12 and 10, which is what you got, 14, 12, and 10. You don't even have eight in this table, right? So you go, so 14, and you are looking for factor load of 275 at a uh, effective length of 24. So you go 365, 329, you with me? Yep. And 293. You stop at 293 because the next one is dropping 157, right? So 293 is 14 by 61. So that's what we got here, right? 14 by 61 is 293, right? And then you go down to the 12s. So you go 24 and you keep going to the right till you hit 12. 12 by 58 is 293. So 12 by 58, right? 12 by 58 is the other selection. And then you keep going to the right on 24 feet effective length. And you reach to 10. And 60 is 367. And 54 is 327. And then 49 is 295. What's wrong with this? You have a 22 foot length instead of 24. I'm looking at wrong, yes. 254. So I'm going to go to 282, 10 by 54, right? You with me on that? So you're looking at that, and you've got 10 by 54, seems to be the lightest anyway, and 867 is no good anyway, and then so you're selecting the lightest column, right? So you have all this with you, it shouldn't be too complicated. What if the tape is not in your this table, right? Then you have to do something else. Like we could probably do that other example using the other table, which is this table. One before that is called the available critical stress phi FCR for compression members, right? So let's go back to that and try to do what we were doing here. This 1054. How can we find out what is, although we eventually will need the, uh, say please, more, yeah, there are 14s available here. Okay. Uh, in this table here, you have 14s available that are heavier, 14 by 74. Now it stops at 74. So you won't be able to do this, this problem anyway, because you, you don't have area or nothing. So let me see if, uh, uh, 18 by, I don't know if 18 by is available also, 18 by 200, I doubt. 18 by 200, no, it's still so, uh, up. This example is not very good. Okay. Hmm. We have to do another one on the board probably. So what what is the process of selection of a member that is not on the table we saw? What is called column table. These are called column tables right there. If you don't have the member here, and you're supposed to select a member other than suppose, this has 14, 12, and 10, right? And you're supposed to select a W8. Why would you be forced to? Because sometimes the space is small and you are required to be small column, eight by eight or less. You can't have room for 10, so you are forced to do eight because of architectural reasons. So how do you do that? It's not here, but it is in the other table. This table gets you, gets you the stress, and there is uh, it's not W8 here either. You may be forced to take a W18, for example, right there, right? So suppose. I can't use this example because the loads are too heavy. So let's try, select a W18 section of A992, the KL is 26. We have to change all this. So let's say the KL is only equal to 12 feet and the loads are B equal to 45 and L equal to 35. Because I'm afraid these won't work for the size of the guard. So then what will change here? your PU equal to 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live. Anyone has good calculator like that, I see one. So 1.2 dead is times 25, plus 1.6 live is 35, is how much? 86. Sorry? 86. 86 kips. All right, so you are supposed to select a W18 for that. Why would you be forced to select W18? Because your wall is too wide and you want to support the wall and you want, don't want a small column, you want a wide column for whatever architectural reason, right? 
So you're supposed to select the W18 for that load. So what you have to do, because you don't know which 18 to go in, in order to calculate, you need to have either the thing listed here on the last table, then you can just simply read, but it's not here. There's no W18 here, right? So you have to find out, remember, go back to the equations we had here. Uh, here, right here. Uh, where was F critical is right there. F critical values are right there. So you can calculate these values multiplied by the gross area. So that's the approach we will take. And it is assume a value of F critical. This is these are the steps one through seven, right? So your step one is assume F critical. How will you assume F critical? You, depending on the length, what is the length? 12 times 12 is 144. And if you look at the R values for uh, these tables here, if you're looking for 18, you got how many 18s you have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8 of them. And if you look at the R minimum, the value goes from 1.27 to 1.7. So let's say R could be around 1.5, right? So what will be uh, KL over R ratio? Expected ratio, right? 1.0, L is 144, R is, we don't know what it is exactly, but let's pick a number of 1.5. Then what is that number? 144 divided by 1.5 is roughly 90 something, 96. Right? So for 96, what is, assuming that as your, is your R, the F critical is from this other table. You see this table? one before the column table, as this table, the Eulers or the F critical values, right? So 96 km over R ratio gives you a stress of F critical of, anyone? 22.9, right? You have that? 22.9. So, so step number two is, three is select a trial selection, <coughs> uh, now let's see, determine the required AG based on F. So what is AG required? Number step, this is two, this is three. AG should be equal to, AG is greater than equal to PU or PFC critical, right? So PU is 86, P is 0.9, and F critical is 20, what was that? 22 something, right? So let's see what that is. 86 um, divided by actually in the table it's it's already more fun to see. Yeah. You're right. It already has so we don't have multiply the point line. So what's the AG required? So AG required is 86 divided by 22. So that's roughly four. Do you need both those AGs up there? Sorry? Do you need both those AGs? Now AG is more than this, is what we need. So, if you go to the uh, section property table, which is like chapter one of your manual for those of you in the class, then you're looking for W18 by something with area of what? 86 divided by 22. That's nothing, is it, right? So the lightest one is 18 by 40 with 11.8 square inches, right? So 18 by 40. Check a trial section. W18 by 40, AG equal to 11, something, right? So that's more than 86 by 22, right? So let's try that. Now what you do is check, uh, repeat step, uh, check for F critical of this particular section. How will you do that? You will have to find out what the R for this particular one is, and it is 1.27. So what is the KL over R ratio? 1.0, 1.44 divided by 1.2. And that is bigger, right, than what we had assumed. 127, right? 127. That is little smaller. What is it now? 1.27? 113.4. Okay. So for 113.4, if you go back to this table here, uh, not this one, the one that has PF critical is 113.4 is 17 
Because uh, in, in your test, they won't ask for real accuracies. They will give you approximate number is good enough. So what was the number? Phi uh, empirical? 17.5. So what is the total load then? Multiply by the AG. How much is the AG? In the other table? 11.8. So that's much more than 86, right? So we are okay. If you're forced to use 18, then 18 by 40 is the column, okay? So that basically tells you how you can design a compression number based on these tables, right? Okay. That's the end of that. Now, there was one more thing here about it. And I, I, I deleted these chart, these nomograms, I thought that would not be part of your uh, provided material. There could be a question on this. This has to do with the column we discussed in the class where column is part of a frame, right? And your K value is calculated by these nomograms. Depending on the relative stiffness of the column to the girder on top and the relative stiffness of the column to the girder on the bottom. Okay? All right, I think we are doing pretty good. I can now move on to the beans part, which I haven't given you the handout. And I'm going to say, I can change my, the other file I have. And I'll have to print this in about 10, 15 minutes. We'll take another break. My legs are telling me I've been standing here for a while, so especially at the end of Thursday. Okay, so the, the, out of the four topic, major topics, tension member, compression member, we have reviewed tension and compression. So now we're gonna look at beams, right? And as you know, beams are top part is in compression, bottom part is in tension, right? So now we can combine tension and compression into one, basically. In other words, we can learn from what we have done in compression for the top flange of the beam. This top flange of the beam is very unstable if you have large load in the manner similar to the car compression member. All right? So we're going to talk about the beams. <coughs> if you hear other words like girders, joists, bowlers, girders, stringers, stringers, or metals, they all basically mean beams or flexural members. Sorry? This is being printed now. I will print it. Oh, okay. Yeah, we will do is in about 10 minutes, we'll take another break. And uh, if, if anyone has problems staying here beyond 9, please tell me if it is a big problem. I don't think we will be able to finish by 9. Okay, but we will finish the beam at nine, and then beam column is a combination. We will start that, and maybe we will quit or see how it goes, okay? But I'm sure we can finish this in about 25 minutes to half an hour, okay? Beams. I'm not sure about beam column, but it, it is a combination of the two, basically. It is, if you have done concrete, it is not much different. You have an interaction equation, and the ratios have to be less than one, just like concrete, right? It's very similar. And you can pick it up from your reference material. We can do that way too. But anyway, let's try beams in general. So the approach is going to be similar to the compression member for the top part of the beam. All right? You're going to watch the top part. The bottom part is in tension and doesn't have any big problems. Right? Okay. The beams generally have no axial force, but if the axial force are significant, then we go to the beam column. Right? But if, if they are small, which is the case for beams, then you just stay with the flexion. So all you have to worry now is the bending moment diagram and the shear force diagram, right? That's, those are the two things. The shear force part is very simple. It's not like concrete. You don't have to worry about ties. You don't have to worry about you know, all that. It's very simple, okay? So we're gonna look at that. Sometimes your flexion controls the size of the beam, but generally the size of the beam is decided by the flexural or moment, and check for shear, make sure it doesn't fail in shear, right? So you don't have to worry about it, usually. 
In, in other words, we don't design for shear and then check for flexion. We design for flexion, check for shear. Okay, beams. Uh, the equation is form is still the same. Remember R U and R N. So this is M U and M N, and the phi is now phi B for for bending. Okay, and phi B is 0.9. And in ASB, MA, MN, and omega B, where MN is the same MN, and omega B is 1.67. And MA is the combination of your live and dead and everything else, right? Okay, so the plastic moment, MP, is the moment at which you can develop the full capacity of the beam or the entire section of the beam is yielding, either in compression or tension. You remember the basic stress diagram we looked at in the steel design class? If you load up a simple beam with a load in the middle, then the extreme fiber has a stress, say Fy. If you keep on increasing the load, then this Fy reaches the yield stress, here as well as here, right? If you further increase the load, then the yield not only is at the extreme fiber, but fibers away from the extreme. So this starts creeping into the other parts of the beam, right? So it becomes there. And if you keep going at that rate, eventually as you increase the load further, <coughs> then this diagram becomes two rectangles. At that point, we have formed a plastic hinge here. It's not a real hinge, it is a plastic hinge because we are on the stress strain diagram and we have gotten into this zone, right? So you are forming plastic. You haven't collapsed yet because you still have the strain hardening for you. It won't break down for you. It will become unserviceable. So you, you want, this is your limit state in other words. You want to stay away from it, right? So anyway, uh, that's why the MP or plastic uh, moment is important. Our goal is to have the section reach plastic moment if possible. And what will come in the way of plastic moment are two problems. One is the local problem, like we had in column, remember we talked about columns, where we said the width to thickness ratio is beyond a certain limit, then you will have local instability, right? So in case of beam, you could have local instability in the flange or in the web, because of thinness of the material, right? That's a local problem. Or you can have a global problem where the top part of the beam is beginning to buckle sideways. It's called, in this case, the buckling is called lateral torsional buckling. It's not simply lateral buckling. Torsional because the bottom flange is trying to stay where it wants to, and the top flange wants to go sideways. So it starts rotating instead of going sideways, okay? So it's lateral torsional buckling, and with MP is achievable if you have enough restraint from that buckling. In other words, you put cross members often enough so that you do not buckle sideways. You don't have lateral torsional buckling. You don't move sideways. You stay where you are quiet till you start yielding in this manner, right? Okay, so let's do a simple example. Uh, looking to the time, I'm not sure. But how do you calculate plastic moment of inertia is the question. So you have a small built up girdle, and how do you calculate how, how, how you, you could have a question like that, that's why I think we should stick to this for a second. Might take a few minutes. So plastic moment of inertia, remember if you have a uh, very simple case of a solid rectangle as your cross section of the beam, and your, your diagram becomes this at the plastic hinge, and this is the cross-sectional beam, then your tension, this is your compression area, and this is your tension area, right? So the compression is going this way, and the tension is going this way. So the, the distance between the tension and compression, let's call it A, then your uh, uh, plastic moment of inertia is Fy times either compression area times A or tension area times A. So this is, Fy is the yield stress times the area of compression is equal to Fy times At is equal to, 
uh, the same area equal to F, Y, Z. So in other words, uh, that multiplied by the A, sorry. So in other words, A, T times A equal to A, C times A equal to Z. So this is how you define plastic moment of inertia now. Uh, it is it a plastic section model? I'm sorry. But there is a table here, isn't it? Right there. This table gives you for all your lower section what is the zx value for a given section, right? In case of rectangle, the AC and AT are exactly same, right there, and that's equal to the width times height, right? In case of wide flange, the complication comes from the fact that the A is not easily found. So this example we have here talks about calculating the uh, center of gravity of the compression and center of gravity of the tension area. And it is not exactly one half the height. This A is more than H over 2. Okay. In this case, A is equal to H over 2. Right? So how do you calculate that? By static moment, taking static moment about the neutral axis, and that's what this equation is all about. Right? I would I would stop at that on this particular one because we need to move on by nine o'clock. Uh, those of you not in the steep class can borrow this example number five point one. How to calculate that? Not very complicated. You, I'm sure you have done it before. Okay. So overall beam stability. The lateral torsional buffering can be prevented by lateral bracing or torsional bracing. So. What you do in lateral bracing is you put a bracing right here by adding another beam. Or in case of torsional bracing, you add a brace like that. So you, you restrain both top and bottom flange from rotating. Okay? So that's the only difference. But in either case, you can prevent lateral torsional buckling or LTB. Okay? So the, you can make the beam stabilized to the point where as you load, you can reach the MP or the plastic moment of section models. So you get the plastic moment, right? So uh, back on the local stability, instability, because it is considered in your syllabus here, uh, the compression elements either buckles at loading lower than one of the overall stability, instability. In other words, before you have overall instability in the compression zone of the beam, you have already buckled either the web or the flange, right? So that is the local instability can mar your, it will stop the beam from developing the full potential, in other words. It will have a premature failure, okay? And it depends on the width to thickness ratio of either the flange or width to thickness ratio of the web. This is, these two ratios come back from the column compression number also, right? You remember those two? But the, the values are different. So if your lambda P, which we will talk about here in a second, if the lambda, the actual B over 2TF is greater than lambda P, then the shape is compact. If it is more than lambda R, then the shape is slender. And in between, it is non-compact. So there are three portions here. One portion is compact, the other one is slender, and the middle one is called non-compact. Okay, three classifications depending on the lambda value. In, in case of roll section, which is what you will have from this book, none of these lambdas will be more than lambda r. You will have most of them right here. 90% of your roll section are right here. 10%, this is a guess though, but only a few. I think altogether there were 11 sections we saw in the class that fall in this range. And uh, I think in the example, I'll list that for a second. So most of the time, you will be compact, all right? Why do you bother with this? Because about 11 or a dozen or so of them in the entire table that you have been given that are non-compact. In other words, they will not have global instability, and you will have a premature local instability, okay? All right, so let's look at this. And this is the list of the sections that are non-compact which have lambda more than lambda p, okay? And these are 
There will be 21 by 44, 14 by 99, 14 by 90, 12 by 65, 10 by 12, 8 by 31, and so on. It's about a dozen of them. Others are, in other words, these are the only ones that will be in this range. None of them are in this range. And the rest of the table is in this range. Okay? All right. So let's look at W16 by 31 beam of A992. In other words, uh, your Fy is equal to 50 ksi. So you have a slab on top providing continuous metal support. How do you provide continuous metal support with a slab? You have a beam and you have put a slab on top where the beam is already embedded inside the slab. So this is your slab. So when this wants to go sideways, there is a notch inside, it's socketed inside the slab, so it won't move, right? Okay. Or it could be that you could have Nelson studs for com composite construction. You could have these studs that are connecting the slab to the, to the beam. Okay. These could be every foot or less. Anyway. So in our case, this is, either one of them is true, and we have a dead load of 0.45 and live of 0.55 kips per linear foot, or KLF. Check B for adequacy. So check the compactness. So make sure it is compact. Is it compact? How can you tell? Because 16 by 31 is not in this list, right? So if you remember this, then you don't have to check. You can say, hey, it is not in this list. But if you don't remember this, then this is what we do. B over T2F is equal to 6.38. It is either in your book or you can go to this table. And if 16 by 31 is here, which it is not there, so you won't have a 16 by 31. You will have something else. So B is given and TF is given, so you can calculate B over T2F for this, right? And it is less than the critical value. This is the critical value, 0.38 times square root of E over Fy, which is 9.15. Since E is given, and Fy is generally for wide length is 50, you remember this magical number, 9.15. If you're below 9.15, you are compact. If it is above 9.15, then it is not. H over Tw is 56, the height divided by thickness of web. And the critical number is 90.5. So you are also, so both web and flange are not going to have local buckling issues. Their thickness is healthy, in other words. Right? So now we can go back to what is the plastic moment of inertia, which is 54, not listed. So you have to calculate this way or you have to calculate, or you have to get it from this. Hopefully, I expect they will give you a section from here, if they do example like this. If not, you should be prepared to do what I was beginning to do here. Hopefully not. Maybe in the PE test, they will do. I don't think they will do it in this file. Level. Okay, MNMP is long test and too many items to cover here, anyway. So your, uh, so your nominal capacity is 225, applied moment is 54.1, and applied live is 61. Altogether is 164, is less than 90% of 225, which is 200. So it is adequate, okay? Now, if the other problem we have is if you don't have enough lateral bracing. So in the plan view, Physically, what does that mean? These cross bracing we show you uh, here in the elevation view. In the plan view, you will have a girder braced or laterally braced by. So this is your main girder supporting the floor in the plan view. Then the cross members are coming at certain distances. So this will be your LB or braced, unbraced length, LB. This LV needs to be compared with the critical values of LP and LR. And LP and LR are given by an equation like this. LP is a function of EOFY and RY. LR is also a function of 
the geometric properties such as these. So if, if, your, if your L is more than LR, then you are really having a problem with lateral torsional bubbling. Why do we have these uh, uh, factors here? This is a torsional factor. These are all section modulus and all that because you're buckling now. This is a pure elastic buckling. If, if your LB is more than LR, then you're going to have an elastic buckling, just like columns. If you're less than LR but more than LP, then you will have inelastic lateral torsional buckling. Right? Remember in column, if it is too slender, then it have buckling very quickly, but it will be elastic buckling. If you have a shorter column, then it will have an inelastic buckling, right? Same thing here. If your value is more than LR, then the, the M value is a smaller number, but it is elastic. In other words, you load a beam, you keep on loading, it will buckle inelastic, elastically for a smaller value. But if you remove the load, it will come back to where it was, right? So the buckling, lateral torsional buckling is elastic in this range. And of course, here you have, when your, your, your LB is less than LP, then you're going to have a plastic, this plastic zone, right? You will have the whole section is going to have a plastic hinge. And in between, it will be inelastic, but will buckle, the compression flange, okay? So this, the, these three categories have to be kept in mind, all right? And this complicating part in this is called CB, a factor of non-uniform applied moment within the unbraced length to be discussed. So the CB is applied here, and the CB is applied here. So you can calculate that CB on next page. If look at this equation for a second, and you see all these factors here has to do with the torsional deformation of the beam. But this right here looks similar to the Euler's equation, pi squared E over L over R squared, right? So this is your buckling equation multiplied by torsional factors. So that's why if LB is more than LR, in other words, you don't have this here, you're farther apart, too far away, more than LR, then it's going to buckle like a Euler's equation, right? Just keep that in mind. If you draw this in a curved manner, then these three areas look like this. This is the equation number three, this is equation number one, and this is the connecting equation number two. So this is elastic lateral torsional buckling. This is inelastic lateral torsional buckling. And this is plastic, you know, uh, what is it called? Uh, MP, right? where you will develop the full plastic moment capacity, okay? So these are the three zones. If you look at uh, these charts you have here, these charts are defined, are, are like that. Let me see if any one of them resemble this here. In the uh, manual, you can very clearly see they look like that, but not here. So this is pretty condensed version. Uh, 12 by 65, 12 by 62. Now you don't see, you either see this part or you see this part, but you don't see the lower part. Uh, anyway, in, in, in this chart, you see th these two, this is not, I wrote that too many of those, just a few. Anyway, okay. Generally, you don't have to calculate all these because they are, the charts are here. But you have to go through this in case they ask you a question. You should be prepared to do some of this. Determine the flexion strength of 14 by 68. I don't know if you have a 14 by 68. They do. OK. Of A242 steel, which is 50 KSI, subject to the following cases. Continuous length support. That means LB equal to zero, unbraced length of 20, and unbraced length of 30. So as you increase the LB from zero, that means you have a slab, like I showed you, or you have 40 or 30. How far apart these beams are. And see what, how they affect, they affect the strength of this member. So if you have continuous support, then LB equal to zero, right? So L, which is less than LP, because LP has 
usually several feet. This LP if you calculate. So the M angle becomes MP, which is FY over V. That's DX. In this case, your DX should be here. 14 by 68, 53, 61, and 14 by 68 is right there. It's about 8 or 9 from the top. It's 14 by 68. These are the ZX tables, right? So you can get your ZX of 14 by 68 is 115, just like this shows, right? So you get your ZX multiplied by the FY and divide by 12 for units, and you get 479. 0.24 kips. That's your capacity. Just keep that in mind. As you increase from 0 to 20 to 30, this will drop lower and lower, right? So you go to the next one, then LB is 20, and CB is given to be 1. Alternatively, you can go to these charts, by the way. So let's go to these charts. See if there is a 14 by 68 here. Yeah, there is actually, right there. Right there is 14 by 68 on the top of the left side. And if your LB is zero, which is less than six, you get a full moment capacity of, according to this, 400, not quite, 35. What did we get in the last page? 479. Anyone can explain that? 14 by 68, I'm getting 479. And this chart says, it is, um, it is multiplied by 0.9, and ours is multiplied or not? No. Okay, that's the difference. There you go. All right, so 430 versus 479 is a difference of 0.9, isn't it? 431, you have your point now, which you pair up with. 479 times 0.9 is 431. It was less than 435, so it is. It is 0.9 times this. So these charts work, right? So you don't have to calculate unless you are asked to. So you can look at the chart. Okay, so go to 20 and you can follow this chart or you can do these calculations. So here we do what we are doing is we are trying to find out where are we in this LP LR business. Your LP is 1.76, RY square root of this is 104.3 or 8.7 feet. We are more than that. Let's look at LR. Pretty complicated. We saw that yesterday, wasn't it? See, you look at the J and SH and HO, these are all listed for you. And you finally get a 29.21 as your LR. And you are between those two, so you are between LP and LR. Right? So you use this equation. Remember I showed you these three equations? One, two, and three. When you are between LR and LP, you use this interpolation. This looks like interpolation, right? The numerator is this, the denominator is this. So the numerator and the denominator is this is a straight line, right? So you go back to this, and you find, find all your values, and then you apply this equation, and you get your value of PMN equal to 343. So let's try this chart, see if you get 343 here. So what is your unbraced length? 20 feet. So you go to 20, and you go up the table, and you look at 68, 14 by 68. It is coming down. Uh, 340 something, 340, up to 340. And we get 343 here, right? So that looks good. Uh, and then if you have LB equal to 30, which is more than the LR, right? So now you have to use this last equation. You have to calculate this value and you multiply that by SX, right? So you're going to calculate that value. So that value is this value, which is like an Euler's equation. CB is one, and all these are calculated. Put into that is 39 point. This is just like the column. Remember how you calculate F critical? So this is the same business, F critical. At this point, it will buckle, right? So the buckling stress is this. You multiply by the section modulus 103, and this is the this is the elastic section modulus 103. How do you get 103? You get 14 by 68 here, right there. 
and the section modulus is listed right here. If you come down to 14 by 68, and it is right there, uh, uh, 103, right? Alternatively, you go to this this chart and hope it doesn't have 30. Sorry, you can't go to this chart. Go stop at 22. So you have to go to that table, right? So that you get this M uh, 291 as mm -hmm. MN, and the strength is 90% of 291 of 262. So you see how you went from uh, 479 to uh, 343 to uh, 291. As you as you increase the spacing of the lateral members, your strength goes down, right? And it follows this kind of curve, basically. Okay. All right. So CD is the other number. The CD is all these charts. This chart is made with CD equal to one. Did they say that here somewhere? They should. Uh, I don't see that here, but they are supposed to be. The AISC tables are all made by CV equal to 1. This should be CV equal to 1, too. Because you will not know. CV depends on the moment variant, how the moment is changing. Okay? If the moment is constant, which is a theoretical situation. It's hard to make that constant. I was giving you an example yesterday, and I'm going to repeat. If you have two loads like this, then this portion of the beam is going to be under constant moment, right there. This is constant moment, right? That's one example, anyway. But if you have any variation, like if you had this load put in the middle, then your moment diagram is triangle, right? So now you have change of the moment variant, and your CV goes up. What that means is all your equations, your your uh, your moment capacity will go up because CV is a multiplier, right? So if CV goes up. All these charts will go up in value by the value of CV, whatever you read here. Except for the MP, you don't want to go above MP, which is the top part here, this flat part. This is your MP value. So your, your chart, instead of having this shape, will go up if your CV is higher than 1. But it will be clipped. It will be clipped here on the top. You cannot go more than MP, because you already have a plastic hinge. You don't want to go beyond that, right? OK. We are, like I said, half an hour was going to make it. And I'm, uh, OK, so this is your uh, CD value. Now, if you put all the n equal to 1 value, then you can see this is becomes, this CD becomes 1. 12 divided by 2 and a half plus 3 is 5.5, plus 4 is 9.5, plus 3 is 12.5. So if all the M's are same, which is true in the middle part, if you have two loads, then the CV becomes one. Otherwise, CV is more than one, if you have any gradient in the load, OK? And uh, you can calculate by putting in the value of MA, which is one fourth point moment, MB is the half point moment, and MC is three quarter point moment. So this will be one quarter, half, three quarters. So these two are same, basically. Right? So you can plug that in and you can find out your CD value, which will be, in this case, we figured yesterday, what was it, 1.66 for this load case, right? All right. And then here's the chart of different values. of uniform loading, CD equal to 1.14, unit loading with LB equal to L over 2, this and that, right? So I'm going to go here and finish this very quickly. Summary starts for moment strength of high shape section. So this is what you do. It, we have talked and talked and we looked at a couple of three examples, but this right here summarizes this page and the next page, what you need to do in a step-by-step -step manner. So the first thing you do is check if the section is compact or not. In other words, is the width to thickness ratio of the flange and the, and the web are less than critical 
then you can go to step B. You can skip all this mess. You go to step B, this calculation, right? But if you are not, then you stay here. So you calculate MN based on lambda. So you calculate lambda. So if your lambda is lambda P or lambda R, you calculate these two. If lambda is less than lambda P, then you go to step B. Again, you back to this one, right? If your lambda is between lambda P and lambda R, then you use this equation. If it is, oh sorry, if the lambda is more than lambda R, then you have another equation, but that doesn't apply to all the rolled sections. You don't need to worry about is this FE test, because you will not be asked for this. So you don't worry about lambda over lambda R. This is for plate girders, okay? All right. So lambda between lambda P and lambda R, you calculate this. So let's look at an example now, how we can apply this. This is the same equation we saw a minute ago. We actually used this, right, for 14 by 68. And you take the least of the two. So if you're checking a 14 by 90, when you check the section is compact or not, and it turns out that the section is not compact, all right, because the lambda is 10.2, lambda P is 9, and lambda R is 24. So you're between 9 and 24 because you're 10, right? So that's why you have to use this equation to find how the local instability will tell you what the value will be. This is the value for local instability. Local instability will, have, local instability will happen at this moment, when the moment reaches that value, okay? So let's keep this as a number for reference while we are doing this. And we find out if you do the, the <coughs> lateral bracing part, which is B step B in here, this is step A, this is step B, right? So we are doing step B, and you're calculating your LP. What is your brace length? I don't have that sketch anymore. So what is the critical brace length is 13 feet, and your, your brace is actually L of 45 and no brace between. So your LR is, your LR after a long labor is 42.5 feet, right? After all this calculation. And it is hopefully listed here, is it? Let me see. No? They don't have an LR listed here. So you may have to do that, hopefully not. That, that takes a while. It's about 20 minutes right there. <laughs> but you have two I, minutes of problem. Huh? You have two minutes for problem. I'm sure we'll make it. We'll I don't think so because I don't see that here anyway. <laughs> All right. Let me summarize real quick here, five minutes. So if since this is lower than this, so the lateral torsional buckling is a lower value. The localized value on the local problem will allow you to go up to this but the global problem will allow you only this much, so you will be stuck with this. You will fail here, in other words, if you want to. Right? This will control your design. Shear strength is calculated by this 60% FY AWCB. All these equations are given. Make sure uh, you do check for shear. And real quick, I'm going to flip through here in the next two minutes. I am going to, we lost a couple of people here, looks like. I was going to print this, and you have your this thing, but just for review, it might be helpful to go through a little more than what you have here. You do have, in this one, B columns, right there on the left-hand page, and basically, you go through the process we went through here in beam section and the column section, and then you have an interaction equation, which finds out if you're less than one or not for the ratio allowed versus applied, okay? so. Should I say we should stop here, I guess? Because we are, we are getting too late in the evening. <laughs> All right. I wish you good luck. <laughs>